fantastic. Um, to those who are dialing in and joining us today, um, these sessions are always really, really, really open. So even though there's a lot of us here, feel free to come off mute, drop a question in the chat, shout at Searsha and I, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. This session is ultimately um, for you guys to get whatever you want out of. So we put some slides together, but we can of course um, take a pause and answer any questions that you have about creating a killer creative brief along the way. Um, so hello to everyone who's joined. Um, my name is Michael Coden. I'm the head of marketing at Pro Quo AI. Um, if you haven't heard of Pro Quo before, you don't need to worry. Uh, we're hoping that you learn a lot from today's session. And we're hoping that many of you become friends with us and join us uh, at future networking events that we have um, month on month. Pro Quo is a brand management platform that a lot of today's brands are currently running on. What our platform does is it analyzes brands of all different shapes and sizes every single day from every an angle. And we use AI to give brand managers a customized action plan for their brand, empowering them to grow their brand with confidence. Before ProQuo, I spent about 10 years at Unilever. Um, I worked in their Americas team. I worked across their European markets and even in their Australasian teams. And my focus was on brand development, um, mainly building kind of product development and briefing in the big campaigns that we launch our new innovations behind each and every year. So I'm not a huge stranger to the creative briefing process. And I'm really hoping that today we have a fantastic uh, session that inspires you guys to write your own creative briefs and get all that you love to get out of every single creative opportunity. Joining me today is Searsha Sadik, who's our head of growth at ProQuo. Searsha, would you like to say a quick hello to all the people here? Of course. Hi, everyone. Um, where Michael was the person who was writing the briefs um, and getting them ready for his agencies, I have always been the person taking those briefs um, from the advertising uh, agency side of things. So I worked as a strategist at BBH, Grey, and most recently Droga5 um, on across sort of every category you can imagine, really, um, from all the FMCGs, food, um, drinks, alcohol, uh, to perfume, hair, um, and insurance, sort of all over the place. Uh, even once on a design project that for launching an area of London, which was the most uh, out of my normal zone one that I did. So I am used to helping brands create these um, creative briefs, which are really powerful, um, and making them as exciting for creatives or as stimulating for your team um, as possible, helping you get to a creative idea that will actually solve the business problem that you're facing. Fantastic. Thank you, Sersha. Um, so today, uh, Sersha and I are going to cover the top five things that you need to know to craft a killer creative brief. Um, and they are. So first, we're going to be talking about setting your business objective and identifying the problem that you need to solve. What that's going to really be all about is understanding kind of with really serious clarity what you want the piece of creative to do, mainly commercially for your brand. Um, after all, you're going to be investing in a campaign, so you want to see that deliver back on your brand and on your brand results somehow. Then we're going to talk about how you define your target audience and how you actually define your brand's opportunity with those target audience. There, we're going to explore different ways that you can look at the population, you can segment them down, and you can really kind of like hone in on where the creative space is that your brand could own. Thirdly, we're going to talk about uncovering my, this is my favorite part, but the human truth behind the campaign idea, the creative idea, and framing kind of the creative task that your brand's faced with. Um, the reality is that every kind of brilliant piece of creative, whatever it is, stems from a real human truth. And they're at the core of great ideas. So we're gonna talk about what they are, how they're made, what makes them simple, what makes them undeniably, and as their name suggests, what, to make, what makes them universally true. Um, fourth, we're gonna go on to setting the key message. Many of you guys who um, are joining us today, we, we had a, a question that you could input into asking what was really important for you to understand when it comes to briefing creative. And a lot of you said, 
the kind of art of distilling your creative brief down into one single simple message. So we're gonna talk about how we find that. And when you do, where you then place that message. And last but not least, we'll talk about creative execution and how you can make sure that your creative idea is consistently optimized for success. Action packed. You, you said that last bit so quickly, that's where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. And then you just create the idea and then off you go. Yeah, and then, yeah, job done, right? Um, we've got a lot to get through today. So hopefully, again, feel free to jump in, interact, um, raise your hands in the chat, drop a comment, whatever makes most uh, comfort up for you guys, please do. Um, so where does it all begin? What's first? What's a creative brief anyway? Um, you can think of a creative brief very much like a blueprint for your brand. Um, you know, whatever it is that whoever it is really that's drumming up your creative idea and taking on your creative challenge, a creative brief is a blueprint for those people. And if nothing else, it should really outline three different things. It should look at the key objective for your campaign first. So what is it that you want your campaign to do for your brand and where do you want it to take you? So that's both from a revenue perspective, but also where do you want it to take people in their own minds and with their feelings and thoughts and their associations with your brand. The second is around um, aligning the creative brief to your overall brand strategy. And its purpose really is to guide the direction of the creative idea so that it stays in line with your brand's ambition. And finally, your creative brief really should be centered around a singular challenge that your brand faces. And um, speaking personally, this was always like the hardest part for me. One thing that really helped me when I was distilling a creative brief down into one single point was to um, give, give yourself a bit of headspace um, because you really want to make sure that your brief is short and sharp. It's so much harder to write something that is simple and single-minded than it is to write a huge um, piece. So really investing the time up front to make sure that you distill your creative brief down into a singular challenge is really paramount. Today, you don't need to worry about scribbling down notes if there's anything interesting actually that we say, hopefully there is but you don't need to worry about scribbling down notes. We've created a template that everyone here can take away that um, you can fill in for your own brief, for your own creative briefs that are up and coming and to use in the future. Um, and we can cascade that after the session, but just feel free to drop a yes in the comments to make sure that we do send that to you if it's something that you feel could help your brand. So I'm gonna pass it off to Sersha kick us off on our first section, which is all about setting your business objective and identifying the problem that you need to solve. Take it away, Serge. Thank you, Michael. Um, lots of people are saying, can we also have the template and the recording? You can have all of it. We'll, uh, we'll send it all after this. Well, I should have added as well, Serge. I can't see anything because I'm projecting. Oh, so okay, all okay. the more reason, yeah, to shout or come off mute if you'd like to say something, please. All right, I've got an eye on the chat just in case, but it's all coming your way. Don't worry about it. So, as Michael said, this, this whole thing starts with setting your business objective, to be honest. A creative idea, the, the whole point of investing in one and spending time developing one and investing in media is to make sure that you see an impact on those metrics that you need affected for your brand. So setting that initial business objective is really critical to make sure that you know what type of creative idea will, will fix the um, problem and get you to the goal that you have. What it also helps do then is when you get to the end and you have this creative idea, or you've got three or four, you can sit there and you can think of that business objective you set right at the beginning of the process and think, does this idea actually deliver on that objective? Do I truly believe that it will do that? And that's a really important part of um, critiquing a creative idea and understanding which one is the, the best one to move forward with. It sounds really obvious, but you would not believe the amount of people who, by the time you've got to the end of the creative process, completely forget about the business objective and, and just move swiftly on. So thinking about what that um, sort of more commercial goal is for your campaign, is it that you need to drive penetration of your brand? Are you trying to steal market share from someone else? Um, do you need to recruit a load of new users or do you have a problem with retention? Do you really need to focus on keeping the people that you have in your brand really happy? Or are you trying to drive trial? There's a load, hundreds of different objectives, but just making sure that you're super clear on which one you're going for 
and also setting a number against it. So what commercial impact would you actually like to have? If your brand is young enough that you're not quite sure what you can expect, set a number and you can then learn at the end of the campaign whether or not it was realistic and move on to the next one with a, with a new number. So as I said, that commercial impact really helps, have, helps you have clarity on what creative idea you actually go with, but also what the messaging is. That's not only the sort of call to action. Obviously, if you're driving trial, you're going to want to be pushing people to, to try your products and your brand, but also the, the sort of overarching feel of the messaging. Does that messaging actually push you towards the objective? Um, and media strategy as well, of course. So if you're going for driving penetration, you're going for big mass, you know, as wide as you can afford to go um, within the right target. Um, whereas if you're going for driving trial, it's probably a lot more one-on-one -on -one, um, and different sort of types of media to push people over the line. The important thing about that is it also helps you to hold to account your internal teams. And if you have a creative agency, it helps you to hold them to account as well. Um, Although from what I've seen on the creative agency side, there's quite a lot of wriggling out of the <laughs> wriggling out of the net. Um, so it's important to keep those numbers um, in the top of your mind. So once you've got that objective of why you're here, um, you then need to identify what your key problem is that you're trying to solve. So is there something that's stopping your growth? What is it that's standing in, in your way? What's the single biggest thing that you need help on um, from a consumer perspective? Um, is there something that's stopping you evolving? Is it that people's behaviours aren't quite aligning with what you need them to do for your brand? Um, are you creating a new occasion? Is a competitor being very challenging? Um, or is your category quite limited? Is it, is it highly competitive in a very small range where it feels like everyone's dancing on a pinhead? Really clearly articulating what that problem is means that you can have much clearer direction in what the creative idea is that you need to develop. Um, so it can take quite a while to get the sort of right um, groundwork in with identifying this problem, but it's honestly so worth it. You wouldn't build a house without laying the right foundations and this identify the problem you need to solve is that that correct foundation. A really good example of this is Fever Tree, and um, we're going to run with the Fever Tree example throughout. Um, it's a, a brand that we we have on our platform, um, so we're we're very in the know of how they're proceeding with things. What happened um, a couple of years ago for anyone who is familiar with Fever Tree, which is a tonic water, um, the premium spirits category was growing. So there's been ever more gins, ever more vodkas, all sorts um, that are becoming quite innovative and quite exciting and quite fresh. Um, so lots of people are becoming more and more aware of what they ate and what they drank. And it says more about you um, as a person, which, which brands you are choosing. And this kind of increasing focus on premium, fo um, premium drinks in this instance was quite weirdly neglecting mixers. So no one had focused on mixers. So you get this beautiful gin and then you put the same old mixer in it, which is Schweppes, which is globally the leader in, in tonic and has been for 50 years. Um, so they identified a real opportunity to disrupt a category that had become really stale and really um, predictable. And they identified that there was a massive opportunity in a premium mixer. So becoming um, a brand which could match the credentials of the spirits that it's being paired with. So they identified very kind of single-mindedly that their business objective was to steal share from Schweppes. Schweppes is the leader. They need to focus in on what Schweppes is doing and disrupt it somehow. So what you then go on to next to do within the um, creative process is really clearly define your target audience and your opportunity. So Defining your target audience, audience is an interesting one because there's so many ways to do it. Um, you can do it by location. You know, we're going to go for people in London or New York, or we're going to go for the UK. Um, you can do it by city, by region, by country, you know, whether it's urban or rural. So that's kind of a much more functional target audience. And that's often related to where your target is actually um, active when using your brand, um, where they live. 
normally. You can also look at the demographics. So age, gender, occupation, socioeconomic position, um, all that kind of stuff. And what that allows you to do is understand the very broad brushstrokes of who you're going after. You know, women 18 to 60, I mean, in all honesty, women 18 to 21 are completely different, uh, let alone 18 to 60. So getting as tight as you can on what that age band is that you're after is really critical. Then you go on to the sort of softer metrics like lifestyle. Does your audience, are they characterized by a particular mindset or hobbies or character or values? This is important in two ways, um, all of this target audience work. One is so that you can have the right type of person in your mind when you're developing your creative idea. If you know that your target is 18 to 25 year old women, you're gonna create a campaign that is very different to if you had uh, 55 to 70 year old women. You're even going to create a different campaign if it was 25 to 35 because their priorities and their values um, and their habits are so different. Their spending power is different. So it's really important to understand in a deep way who those um, people are and what they care about. You can then get into things like behaviors as well. So how do they use certain products or services? How do they use certain categories? Um, and structuring it in these four ways kind of helps you to get a pretty 360 view of who the person you're going after is. I'm personally not a particularly big fan of sort of profiling per person, you know, like um, Doris from Sunderland likes chips and goes to the pub every Friday. Um, but I think building like that well-rounded uh, picture of who the person is, who that type of person is, is, is really important. So using Fever Tree, for example, they went really after urban areas, so they didn't go particularly for any gender, um, but they were very clear that they were going to cities first. And they went for 24 to 39 year olds. And that was because younger than 24, you probably don't care very much about premium anything, um, particularly premium spirits. So they wanted people to have enough spending power and enough interest to, to actually care about Fever Tree. And their habits were people who care about um, and eat food and drink for pleasure. So it's not just to, to get drunk or to um, eat, it was to um, enjoy the process. As Michael said, just shout with questions in the, in the chat or off mute if you have any, otherwise I'm just gonna keep rolling on. <laughs> so right now you've set your business objective you've worked out what, what it, why it is you're here, and you kind of understand the problem. You understand what the key barrier is in your way. You've also thought about who that barrier is most important to and what they care about. The next thing to understand is, what do your customers feel and think now? What is it that about your category and about your brand? Um, what do they expect from you? So um, taking Uber, for example, um, they, People expect very, very rational things in the bottom eight there. Those are very rational drivers. They expect the Uber to turn up on time. They expect to always be able to call it. They expect it to be pretty reliable. They expect it to get them from A to B. Um, and, you know, they expect it to be pretty familiar. They get what Uber is. What they don't expect from, from Uber is anything to do with integrity or transparency or popularity, for example, um, because they don't think Uber behaves in a particularly nice way. When you look at the new um, sort of ride hailing version of the taxi industry, that the profile of it is very similar to Uber because Uber is the leader in that category and they're defining how people see it. What they did, which disrupted very much the, the taxi category that came before it, which was um, black cabs in London, yellow cabs in New York, um, basically ones that you hailed with your hand as you saw them going past, um, was fundamentally understand where the gap was. And the gap was that old school taxis were not empathetic. They didn't really understand what consumers need. They were never there when you needed them. It cost you an arm and a leg to even get into one. So it was really, really expensive. Um, and the experience when you were in them was a little bit dodgy. You weren't always sure what you were gonna get. So Uber understood that a combination of those three things being able to get a cab when you needed one, um, being able to have a relatively consistent experience 
um, and to be able to sort of seamlessly pay for one in an affordable way would utterly change the way people felt about the category. So they spotted that opportunity and they made the most of it. And you can see what happened then. They've gone global and now they've got lots of competitors like Lyft who are snapping at their heels. So understanding what, how it is that people feel about you and how people feel about your category is critical in understanding where the opportunities are. What's really important is almost to map out how people feel about your brand now or um, look at it on these 16 drivers and identify which drivers it is you want them to feel differently about. So say your brand isn't particularly aspirational, people don't find it very desirable. You can circle that one and be like, right, people don't expect this much in my category, um, but this is what I want to, to absolutely focus on because it would be very disruptive. So an example here is Fever Tree. Actually, Michael, if we go on to the next one, I think it might be clearer. So this is Fever Tree here. Um, as I mentioned, we have them on our platform. So Fever Tree is on the left and the mixers category is on the right. So this is what people think of Fever Tree and expect from mixers. As you can see, they're almost directly inverted. <laughs> um, so where the mixers category on the right, um, people expect very rational um, things from it down in the bottom uh, right hand quadrant there. They and they don't really expect any sort of seduction or emotion up in the top uh, left hand corner. When you look at Fever Tree, they actually massively over deliver where people aren't expecting. They're very seductive. They have a really strong personality. They pull people in and they do things very differently to the rest of the category. And they're emotional, you know, they've worked out how to have that emotional connection and pull toward um, to people. And you can see there why Fever Tree has been so disruptive of mixers. Um, because if you look at Schweppes on top of this, they look almost identical to the what people expect from the category. There's nothing particularly different there. They're like, yeah, Schweppes. Um, okay, it's, you know, it's tonic. It is what tonic is but it's not exciting and it's a real threat to them and they're gonna lose a lot, of, a lot of space to new new entrants because they've got too comfortable. So take a peek at your competition. You've got this look at what you are, what people expect from your category and you've got kind of an idea now of where how you wanna change the way people feel about you. What is it that you want them to think differently and feel differently after they've seen your creative? Comparing that then against how people, how people see your competitors is really important because it might be that you've identified aspiration. No one, no one particularly expects it, so it'll be disruptive and your brand isn't great at it yet. However, if you look at your competition and someone is doing brilliantly at aspiration, you might want to think twice about it because it means it's not going to be that differentiated. So when you look here, you can see Fever Tree is the white dots, Fentimans is the green dots and Schweppes is the red ones. You can see that Fever Tree is really competitive with Schweppes. So that's great. They're moving up over the time we've had them. They've been moving up and up and up. However, you can see that Fentimans is actually very close to Fever Tree as well. And that's because they've been making some real inroads. So Fever Tree needs to keep a very close eye on them in the kind of rear view mirror, because even when you look at transparency here, which is you know, how open and honest your brand is, Fentimans is actually gonna start taking the lead. So you can then understand what your likelihood of success is on that driver. How competitive is it gonna be? Is it gonna be a really hard thing to do because everyone else is doing it? Or actually, is this a space that no one else is in? And it's a real opportunity for your brand to stand out. Sears, one, one interesting thing that jumps out to me when it comes to a brand like Fever Tree is like understanding, as you said, the dynamics of a category um, and where kind of your brand's best position to disrupt it or even white space opportunities is quite an, it's an important part of the creative process. And so here, we've kind of outlined um, a couple of the different drivers. So innovation, aspiration, and differentiation. You can see that Fever Tree, which is the white dots flatlined across as an index, they're actually winning 
on those lesser important drivers in the category, but it's a massive opportunity for them to shake things up and to drive value into a category that's very much rational. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And what's cool as well is that they're doing things on the left side of the equation pretty good too. So they're, they've got quite a balanced um, profile, but a massive opportunity to kind of shake up on the innovation, aspiration, and differentiation side. Exactly. Um, is it oh, back over to me? Back over to you, buddy. Awesome. <laughs> My favorite part, the human truth um, and framing the task. All right. Again, any questions as we go through, feel free just to drop them in the chat. Um, human truths are really at the core of every great brand, I think, and feel, <laughs> and every great idea. Um, they're super simple. They're true across a wide group of people. And you really want to discover what the human truth is, specifically the undeniable truth, specifically for the group that you're going after, your target audience. So you want to think kind of long and hard about what's common in that group, but maybe not immediately obvious. Um, when I kind of think about finding human tr truths, the, the gold is when you can figure one out where people are like, oh yeah, you know, I do that, but I thought I was the only one. Those are really great human truth spaces. Um, so like an example of my role um, right now, um, you know, it might be odd to say, but I sometimes can feel insecure in my day job um, and discovering why that's the case, what's driving my feeling of insecurity is a really interesting way to start to uncover what the human truth might be behind that feeling. And if I ask myself, you know, why do you feel insecure sometimes day to day? It could be derived from like this feeling that I have of maybe uncertainty and the fact that I don't really know day to day if like the decisions I'm making are actually the best decisions for me, both professionally and also for my brand. And you, I could feel that I'm alone in that emotion, but if I were to ask people who are here today, whether you've ever felt insecure because you have maybe not all the, 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 the answers at your fingertips to make, to make you know, immediate decisions, many of you might say, yeah, I felt that before too. And that's a really interesting human truth to start to uncover um, about a population um, you know, that you're associated with. Equally, you can look at kind of cultural shifts um, that might be driving people's behavioral changes and creating kind of like zeitgeist within your campaign and even shifts that people are experiencing within their day-to-day -day lives. So obviously COVID and over the last year has really changed the way that people behave, the way that people are thinking, the way that people are feeling and acting and really picking apart what's going on today and keeping your finger on the pulse of those changing times is really important to um, discovering what the human truth is behind your creative idea. So if we take that a step further in the case of Fever Tree, there could be a really interesting kind of human truth around how a drink is constructed, for example. Um, and the idea being that it can be quite a highly personal thing. I'm gonna tell you a story about Saoirse, speaking of personal thing <laughs> rather than myself, and I'll deflect uh, this example, but she was telling me about a gin and tonic uh, recently that her mother made her. And within it, she said that she could barely taste the gin. True or false, Saoirse? Very true. My okay. mother was being far too restrained with her what, gin application. What happened when your younger brother made you a second gin and tonic? Honestly, for full context, my brother is at university. Um, and so he, I'll give him a free pass on just quite how much gin he put in it. But it was, I, I think it was over half. It was unbelievable. It wasn't even drinkable. Way too much. <laughs> So there's 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 this obvious tension between this makes it, making a mixed drink is a personal thing to begin with. But the level of how much mixer you use versus how much alcohol you use can cause a bit of tension. So identifying that within your human truth, like the tension I expressed earlier behind this feeling of being uncertain and my desire to succeed, it's the tension that you want to find and really place at the center of the idea. So whether it's my example of feeling insecure through uncertainty or the fever tree example of 
debate over the right level of gin versus tonic. You'll see later on how they use that insight that it is a very personal thing, that truth that it's a very personal thing to actually develop their single-minded point to communicate. We'll come on to that in just a moment. Um, so once you've identified the human truth, then you need to figure out how do I frame my task? And there's an outline that I like to use, um, which <laughs> it's called the get to buy framework. And it's a way of like distilling quite a complicated task at hand that you might be feeling into a simple campaign objective in a sentence. And the cool thing about it is that it's a formula. So you can, it won't generally steer you wrong. Um, get is all about who you want to get. So it's your target audience. You want to get someone, get a group. Two is to do something. So you want to link the two to your business objective. Like Sirish was talking about at the start, the fever treat was about stealing share, getting more people to buy you versus them. And then buy how. So buy is all about your marketing objective. What's that mindset shift that you want to create from your communication? And how do you want to change people's feelings and thoughts behind um, their relationship with your brand? So it's about getting people to purchase your brand by telling them something that seduces or persuades them and ultimately changes their relationship that they have with you. So let's, let's kind of explore this through um, the same fever tree um, example. Um, remember, they want to grow their brand by stealing share from uh, Schweppes. So they might frame their task by saying that they want to get 24 to 39 year olds uh, who live in cities, for example, to choose fever tree over Schweppes by convincing them that fever tree is a more aspirational and better tasting option. So we've taken a really complicated world that Fever Tree might be living in around um, Fentimans versus Schweppes and said, okay, who is it that they're going after? What is it that they want to do from a business perspective? And how do they want to change people's minds to meet that business result? Who do I want to get? Where do I want to find growth from? What do I want to say to drive growth? All right. So, um, now we're going to even go a bit deeper and talk about the key message for the creative brief and deciding um, where you're going to then place that media. And this was the, the as I said at the start, a lot of the questions um, that came in from you guys was all about setting the key message and kind of distilling the campaign task down into kind of one um, single simple sentence. And it really, it isn't easy. Um, when I was working at Unilever, it was one of the more common missteps we made. And I would bet that Sirish has been on the receiving end of a lot of briefs that are trying to do a lot of things. Um, <laughs> yes or no? Yeah, I would imagine probably so. I think my record one was 30 pages. Yeah. Someone sent me um, a 30 page brief. And I was like, I just, okie dokie, we're going to have to find a key message in here somewhere. <laughs> And that shouldn't be the job of the creative agency. That's really the job of the person who's constructing the brief is to distill that message. What is it that you want someone to take away down into one sentence? Um, it's not to say that the creative agency shouldn't help you articulate it or get it right, but for you to know whether you've been successful and for you to have clarity on what you're asking for, it's important to have at least the beginning of what that message is if you're briefing it out to an agency. If you're doing it in-house, obviously you need to, to do that work yourself. I mean, an example, a funny story actually that, that happened to me is that we, we had two VPs when I worked on at the Axe uh, Lynx body spray brand, and they would kind of argue and debate over what was the brief about, and then suddenly both ideas would come in there. And what I started to learn was that if you ever hear the word hybrid, <laughs> Along <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> when developing a piece of creative, if you, if you ever let the word hybrid slip out of your lips, stop for a moment and reflect because it's the worst thing that you can do is they'll you'll say either let's create a hybrid or that's interesting let's match the two together a frankenstein you want to avoid that language completely i uh, mean that it's interesting because it was one of the first things that i got taught to do in um strategy which was to think so carefully about how to construct that that key message and there are so many like insider tips that help you to get it right like um it sounds really uh crazy but 
think about every single word and write, write down all of the, the sentences that you can think of that might be the, the key message. And when you're constructing it, go through every single word and think, what is this word doing? Is it working really hard? Is it as emotional as it can be? Um, is it as motivating as it can be? And funnily enough, by going through that process, not only do you actually end up with a better sentence, but you end up with much more clarity on the emotions that you're trying to elicit and the message that you're trying to get across because you've thought very critically about every part, every single piece of that puzzle that you're building. Um, so it's actually a really helpful exercise for crystallizing what you're trying to what you're trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've given three examples here in, in different kind of categories. Um, Bounty, for those who haven't heard of it, is a US paper towel brand. Um, and they kind of have communicated with consistency for years. They even have a jingle around it that our team was singing <laughs> yesterday, Bridget, um, around their product's performance. And, you know, the product, you know, communicates that it picks up liquid fast. The way the creative articulation of that is that their bounty, the quilted quicker picker upper, it's a paper towel that picks up liquid fast. Um, equally, you could, you know, think about Red Bull. Red Bull promises, um, you know, that as a result of drinking it, it's going to make you kind of metaphorically feel like you're flying. Um, they express that as Red Bull gives you wings. Now, of course, Red Bull gives you wings was not in the creative brief. That's the expression of the single-minded point to communicate that when you drink Red Bull, you get a feeling like you're flying, that you have the sense of energy. Or finally, Dove um, has communicated for years um, it's kind of campaign around real beauty kind of kicked it off, but figuring out a way to communicate in terms of established beliefs on its head is what um, Dove has done year on year around its campaign for real beauty and using real women throughout its advertising communication. Within all three of those examples, there are reasons to believe behind your single minded communication point and your message that's also important to uncover. So regardless of your brand, you really want to kind of let your communication message be the derivative of why people should be believing you in the first place. So it could be that um, there is a functional message behind your, I should say a functional benefit behind your message like Bounty or Red Bull, or there could be a more emotional benefit like the example of Dove in Real Beauty Whatever you're, whatever you're aiming to communicate, definitely, as Sirsha said, take the time to distill it down into one single simple message. It does not have to be a creative line, but what's the one thing that you want people to take away? And that's gonna be an amazing creative springboard for your agency to be thinking around. And people can only take away one message anyway. So there's no point to try and stuff more communication ideas into it. Um, Sirish, I can see your, um, do you want to build on that? Oh, I'm doing that thing where I like repeatedly open my mouth because I've got something to say and it's just really obvious. I'm excited to hear. <laughs> um, sorry. No, no, go for it. <laughs> um, what, I think what's interesting in um, the functional and emotional space as well is that you, every product has a functional benefit. You know, you exist for a reason. You're there. You've, you've got a benefit to people. It's why anyone is buying you to begin with. So a functional benefit is very often much more expected um, and it's often a lot less exciting. So people can get very stuck in writing this key message if all they're focusing on is that functional benefit because it will come out feeling really like, yeah, okay, you know, that's what all my competitors say and, and you know, that's kind of what I was expecting to say. So where you can introduce a lot of excitement is by weaving in that emotional benefit into your key message as well. Why should people care? what benefit like why does it bring more joy to their lives does it bring more excitement does it make them feel safer you know where is the most interesting area of emotional benefit that's believable for your product um, and pushing those two things together really works for example in the dove one dove stands for real beauty okay beauty dove is a beauty product you know it does moisturizers it does washes it does all of that sort of stuff but by introducing stands for real, they've brought real integrity and they've brought that emotional benefit of they stand for something and they care about you and they care about you know, society. So they've really woven those two things together to create a really strong key message. 
Thanks, Sirsh. And in taking that ex um, further into the fever tree example, we all remember that fever tree's objective is to steal share from, from Schweppes. And we wanted to do that by convincing their target audience that they were better tasting. So their performance was strong. And they were also kind of the most aspirational. Um, the human truth and the tension that we found behind that was around kind of mixing a gin and a tonic is a very personal thing. And the tension being that everyone has a difference in taste. So to kind of bring it all together, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So to bring it all together, Fever Tree may want people to take away that 75% of a drink is a mixer. Um, you know, so it's really key that that mixer is great. And so their brief to an agency might be that, you know, we know that 75% of a drink is the mixer. So mixing with a great uh, product is important. Okay. Deciding where you'll broadcast the eventual creative idea. Um, I think the critical thing to kind of take away here is that it's important to know where your campaign is going to land before you brief the creative idea into the agency. So for example, if your creative team, um, you, they might think differently if you said to them, this is gonna be an idea for TV. And they might think differently if you said, this is gonna be an idea for digital, or if we're briefing an idea for um, TV and print versus an out of home ad where people have longer dwell times, or you want a piece of thumb stopping creative that lives on digital um, social media rather than a bus shelter giving them an idea of the medium that they're thinking for um, and where that message is going to be received. It's really important to ensure that the idea is able to land properly with people. And when that idea is executed, it's actually able to be absorbed by people. I'm going to pass uh, it back to you, Sirish, if that's all right. Sure thing. How to create your idea and decide how to measure its success. So, at this point, you've brought together your business objective, your problem, your target audience, um, what, how you want their behavior to change, how you want them to feel differently about your brand. You've got an idea about what kind of channels you're gonna go for and the thing, if they walked away, the single thing that they knew, your key message. So all of the scaffolding is built, all of the lines are drawn. Now it's just coloring in, finding out what idea will pull all of those things together. And the answer to creating your idea is that it's not a linear process. You know, you can't say if you think about X, Y, Z, it, it will all come together. There has to be some sort of um, spark, some idea, some slightly lateral way of thinking about um, all of those things together. The important thing, I think, is to hold them all in the back of your mind. So don't constantly think, you know, what does a 25 year old want? You know that you're after 25 year olds. Just let that kind of sit. In, in your mind, don't constantly obsess over one particular part of it, you know it, sort of have confidence in that. Um, and when you're going about your creative idea, instead think about three particular areas. So what you hear, so what are you telling people? Um, what you see, which is, you know, what are they looking at um, in, in whatever medium you've chosen? And how does the brand tie all of that together? If you think about what you see and what you hear, how will people feel about those two things? How does the brand link them? So when you're thinking about what you hear, it's about what the most motivating expression of that message is. Um, is it that you are really punchy in the way that you write it? Is it that you take a very lateral angle? Is it that you're very challenging? You know, um, one brand that we work with um, is seen as really bad quality food um, I'm, they won't mind me saying that, we all know it to be true, um, but really low quality when in actual fact, they go to an enormous effort to make sure that their product is really well made of really great ingredients. Um, but they have a very long history of, of being seen as a, a convenience brand. So the way that they've chosen to do, um, do what people are hearing and what their key messages and how they speak is by saying, you think that we're bad, don't you? But we're not they could have gone out and said we're really good quality we're really good quality food 
But the reality is, is that that's what everyone in food is saying. So it's not particularly stimulating or exciting for people to hear. But when people hear, you think we're rubbish, don't you? But we're not. That makes people's ears prick up. You're saying the same thing, but in a different way. So just thinking about what the kind of uh, metadata for people is around the way that you're saying things. Um, and above all, keep it really clear. If in doubt, go for the clearer option um, because things can get a bit lost in translation too easily when, when you're going out with these communications. Then when you think about what you're seeing, the purpose of what you're seeing is to reinforce what you're hearing. It's to make sure that the sort of physical way that people are experiencing the brand is also grabbing people's attention and is making sure that it's kind of bolding and underlining that message that they're hearing. Um, so again, it's that balance between how do you make it stand out? Um, and what I'd suggest here is going and looking at what everyone in your category is doing. Look at all of their approaches. Um, you know, we used to just build decks of what everyone was doing this month, which I'm sure you guys do too as well. And whatever they're doing, work out what the, what the norms are. So everyone uses blue, everyone writes in this font, everyone talks about stability, whatever the thing is, and you do something different. Find a, a visual way of differentiating yourself. Another good thing to do here is look at categories which are quite aspirational for you. Um, so in the same way that supermarket brands uh, might be competing with Deliveroo for, for the dinner occasion, um, can you take any of what Deliveroo are doing in the way that they communicate and the way that they look and pull it into your brand to, to borrow some of that equity? Or in fact, can you look at an airline which is completely different, but they have a very similar challenge to you? Um, so just making sure that you spread the net within your category and then look strategically more widely to, to get some new ideas. And then think about what that means for how people see your brand. Um, does it give you the right representation of who the brand is? Is it showing that your brand is a grown up? Is it showing that your brand is a playful child? Um, is it showing that you know, you've really got it down or that it's there for you when you need it? How, how does the brand tie it all together and why will people feel better about the brand once they've seen your idea? Um, so after this, you almost definitely will have a few ideas um, on the table <laughs> and the next tough step is deciding which one to go with. And the problem here is um, as someone who's managed uh, probably a hundred moody creatives, sorry if anyone's a creative on the line, um, it's a really personal and emotional area because you've come up with an idea and you genuinely think it's the best one and, and you love it. Um, and that's how everyone feels about the idea that they've come up with. So what's important here is not to let sort of subjectivity get too involved. Look back at that business objective that you said at the beginning, look back at the challenge that you established and look at your target audience. Look at the way you wanted people to change their behavior. Which of these ideas does those things best? The other things to look at are, you know, is the message crystal clear? Does it deliver the message in a way that is unusual? Um, is it unexpected? Will it, you know, will people remember it the following week? Um, and, and does it represent who you want your brand to be? So after all of that, you kind of sift through the ideas and, and one will inevitably come to the top. For the fever tree example that we've kind of been pulling through, they turned this idea of saying on average 75% of the drink is mixer and we're the best drink, uh, we're the best tasting mixer out there. They went very clear with that message. And they reinforced that by showing provenant scenery and refreshing cues, both of which show how tasty the brand is. You know, we use good quality ingredients, so we're premium, we are the best. We are refreshing, we are delicious, remember why you like gin and tonics. So you're hearing we're the best mix tasting mixer out there and you're seeing why they're the best mi tasting mixer out there. And when you take a step back from those kind of executional elements, you see that the brand is tied together with that really calm, but very premium, quite innovative feeling um, sort of wrapper. And they, it kind of directly reflects all of the things that, that Fever Tree 
feel are their, their key values and their tone of voice. At Cibitry, we wanted to put quality back into mixed drinks. We went to the ends of the earth to find the most authentic, naturally sourced ingredients for our ginger ales, ginger beers, and tonic waters. No other company goes to these lengths to create the best drinks. And what's more, they're made with absolutely no artificial sweetness or colors. Fever Tree. If three calls your drink is the mixer, mix with the best. Cool. I don't know if everyone's seen that ad before. It's a, it's a nice one. Um, and it articulates kind of the objective that they had of the differences in taste, the importance of driving performance yet aspiration through a single minded message that if three quarters of your drink is a mixer, mix with the best. Um, so how do you understand whether or not your finished piece of creative is actually delivered um, for your brand? And you might have a way of keeping an eye on your brand every day, but there's creative things that you can do on top of that um, to really understand if, if what you've delivered is meeting your overall business objective. The first is to look at whether or not people are talking more about your brand than they were before. So you could look at your search volume online, you could look at your, your website visits, the number of followers that you're brand has on social media, you know, you could look at how many times people are mentioning you. Um, any of those or all of those would be a really good indication as to whether or not your message is landing and resonating with the public in a positive way. Um, you could even look at your product reviews as a second option. Are people kind of speaking more favorably about your brand? You know, as a result of that campaign being out there, are you seeing the frequency of your product reviews and your star ratings improve on dot com platforms? Um, I mentioned kind of the followers in, in the engagement in your social channels already, but um, the final one is around kind of the price sensitivity that your brand might be, that people might be experiencing around your brand and market. And it's a really important one to look at if you have the ability to your baseline rate of sale. Um, are those going up in store? So are people more willing to purchase you at full price than when you're say like at 50% off or on a discount? Um, that's a huge one. Are people willing, is your brand worth it when they're, when they're faced with options at shelf and are they willing to pick yours um, when it's on at full price? Um, here at ProQuo, um, we've got a technology that brands use to kind of optimize their creative idea. And they use it at any stage of development within the full creative process. So whether you want to understand what people are thinking or feeling about an idea that's only on paper, maybe it's a concept, if it's um, an animatic storyboard, a finished film, a new product idea, a new pack idea, whatever, um, literally anything, you can chuck it into our creative lab. And in a few hours, you'll get the results back from 300 people. So you can kind of understand at any stage within your development process, um, whether the idea that you're about to go ahead with, whether that's gonna have a positive impact on your brand. And if so, is that positive impact actually in the direction that you wanna take your brand and your brand strategy? So, um, we are here to help um, and we'd love to help. Um, as I promised at the beginning, um, we've created a really handy template um, that outlines everything that Sirsha and I walked through top to bottom um, where you can input your business objective, you can set your campaign tasks, you can input your target audience, your communication point, everything. So you'll know that you've got kind of all your bases covered when it comes to briefing your next uh, creative idea. So if you guys would like to get a hold of that, just drop us a comment here in the chat or raise your hand and we can make sure that we send that after um, we finish up today. There has been lots of asking for it, um, Michael, which is good. Um, and last but not least, if you've, if you've enjoyed what we've covered today, um, and hopefully you have, and hopefully you've learned something, um, we definitely invite you to join a future session and join our kind of growing network of brands where only as you know, helpful as the brands that want us to help and want to listen to us. And hopefully you've learned something today. Um, we're working with some pretty awesome brands right now. 
we're dishing out loads of content, you know, week on week, all around the world of brand management. And every day we're providing brands with kind of real time analysis, giving them those custom action plans that they need, which help them succeed. And in February, we're going to be having three different sessions like this. Um, we're going to be kicking off the month talking about how to build brands that people fall in love with, that people fall head over heels for just in time for Valentine's Day. Um, that'll be with Sirsha and I um, through our series called What the Fact FAQs that explores the most commonly asked questions that brand managers have in, in the world of uh, brand management. Like, how do I build a brand strategy? How do I construct a really killer trade story that's going to get my brand more distribution? How do I develop new products um, in just the right way? And then in the middle of the month, we're going to be joined by Melissa Hobley, who's the global CMO at OKCupid. And she's going to be talking to us all about culture marketing and how her brands really smashed it when it comes to relevancy. And that's uh, happening, in, happening in a series that we're calling Pro Quo Stands With, which speaks to brand leaders and how they're growing, as well as subject matter experts in the world of brand management. And last but not least, on the 23rd of Feb, we're going to have our um, event called What's on Fire that looks at category trends. So each month, we're going to be exploring a really hot trend in the market. We'll look at what's driving the category, what do people feel and think about the category, how you might win within the category, how you might capitalize on growth trends within the category. And our first event in February is going to be looking at the low and no alcoholic beverage market through the eyes of the US and the UK markets. And these series, is, um, these pillars will be running month on month. Um, and just today, we're launching as well a Slack channel. So all of the content from today will be in our new Slack channel called the Brand Management Exchange, which we'll share a link to following this. So definitely just dive in there. We'll share a link to the webinar. We'll share the templates. We'll share the creative brief that we've gone through. And literally week on week, we're having blogs, we're having guides, we're having templates that we're going to drop into that Slack channel. And it'll be a really awesome safe space for you to as well meet other brand managers like you to communicate, to ask for advice, um, and to generally uh, grow your brands uh, together. So thank you guys very much. We're bang on time. Um, are there any questions in the chat, guys? I can't see it, but hopefully everyone's... There's no um, questions, but people are being very kind. Thank you, everyone. We've really enjoyed being here today. <laughs> it's been a delight. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to, to drop them now, or we will see you at the next session or in the Slack channel. All right. Fantastic, everyone. Um, wherever you are in the world, wishing you a good rest of the day and a nice week ahead, and hopefully see you at, see you on Slack. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>